So this is a little bit of background in, in, in some of it to entice you to read this book. I got really engrossed in your story. And you were born in Louisiana, Monroe, Louisiana, which is not New Orleans. And yes, there's more to Louisiana than New Orleans. <laughs> and you know, you're born to a teen mom and you were, you called it farmed out, but yeah. kind of moved around to different families over the course of your life and somehow made your way to the West Coast and to Oakland. And in the face of lots of discrimination, accomplished what most people would never dream of accomplishing in their life. Uh, at some point you were a single mom, mm -hmm. uh, you were black, you were a woman, <laughs> and you managed to become a news reporter, <laughs> the first black female news reporter on the West Coast. Part of your journey has really been involved in just transcending all different mediums, from being on the radio, to TV, to newspapers, everything. And you've covered the gamut, and you're self-taught. And your story is so rich, and I'm not gonna let everybody, I'll let you tell some of it, but your story is so rich <laughs> in purpose, and just a purpose-driven life that you've led. And you've managed to interview everyone from Frank Sinatra to Fidel Castro. And I would say that really describes the gamut of talking to mm. and meeting with some of the most noteworthy and newsworthy people of your time and, and in fact, of our time. You're currently host of the show This Week in Northern California, hosted by KQED, where you talk about current topics ranging from politics and other current events. And you're a Bay Area legend, winner of six local Emmys, and we're just happy to have you here. Never in your wildest dreams is your story, and you had the courage to tell it. So thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing your story. Please welcome Belva Davis. Thank you. Wonderful introduction. <laughs> Why don't you start by just telling us what inspired you to tell your story, to write your story, and share it with the world? I think it's because we live in a time when so many young people are giving up. All you need to do is look at the national dropout rate for minority youngsters, mm -hmm. and you know that we are living in perilous times. Mm -hmm. And many of the excuses that I would hear from young people as I do stories about how to get people back on track, how to bring, uh, keep kids in school longer, were a list of stereotypical things that can happen in a life. And if we give up on those points, uh, then we are cut adrift from the major society. And I just wanted to chronicle for any younger person or even any older person who's thinking, you know, I can't do this anymore, that there are rewards for hanging in there, for having wild dreams, for envisioning yourself is whatever it is that you think will make you happy. And if you can somehow along the way convince yourself to do the work that it takes to get where you want to go, then there you are. So that was my, my main thought, my main motive, as I started to work on the book, I realized that my position had been unique. There was a lot of history in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, turbulent times. We, we, when you put it all together in a book and you realize the sprees of murder, suicides, uh, protests, head knockings going on, that they were totally different from today's world. And I saw it through the eyes of a woman who came not from a career as a prepared journalist, but just an ordinary citizen who happened to be black. Until my face was known on television, I experienced every, not every, but I, sit, I experienced the kinds of tough life it is to be black in America. Mm -hmm. And I thought, um, there are stories to be told, even after you break the color bar, that the, uh, these incidents don't stop, uh, and they become a little harder to maneuver, to get around and to keep your self-respect. And so even in writing the stories, I thought, well, I have a different view than my fellow male reporters. And 
And when I started, I was not just the first black woman, I was the first woman street reporter. Mm -hmm. And it was a place where the stand-up guys back then were not all welcoming. Mm -hmm. So uh, it just seemed that, if for nothing else than the fact that I'm a grandmother now, that my granddaughter should know what her grandma's life was like. And if she ever, ever thought of giving up on herself, <laughs> she would know that she had, you know, the muscle to, to do it if she just put her mind to it. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. I was, when I was reading the book, there were certainly moments for me, while I didn't live in that generation, where I drew parallels to my own life and people who came before me. And I saw a lot of teachings from my own family about how to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And I can think back to the 1964 Republican National Convention where in the story you, you talk about, and I want you to share with this group kind of what that experience was like, where you had to show a tremendous amount of resilience and courage in order to tell a story <laughs> and share with the public. So why don't you share with us yeah. a little bit about that? Yesterday, uh, I listened to Tabas Smiley talk about his life story mm -hmm. in a book called Fail Up. Well, I think of the Republican convention like that. It was a bad, terrible incident, but it inspired me to do something that I may, might not have ever done had that been a pleasant, ordinary, normal <laughs> convention. But it wasn't. It was, um, it was when America was making another well, making a very sharp turn politically. It was the Goldwater Convention. Um, it was the year the Dixiecrats, I said, moved in and co-opted the Republican Party, the moderate Republican Party. It was uh, raucous in every way that you could think of. The black delegates were treated extremely bad. One had acid thrown on his clothes. Others were refused seats, even though they were delegates. Um, Jackie Robinson, the famed baseball player, was almost into a fist fight with somebody. It was that hot. The major media was at war with this group. Uh, and mostly because uh, America was changing then. The Civil Rights Act had just been signed in 64. 63, President Kennedy had been shot. Uh, President Johnson seemed akin to picking up the work that Kennedy had started in making life more pleasant for African Americans, Negroes back then. And uh, so they were suffering those changes, echoes of what we hear today from some members of the Tea Party. They wanted to make sure that their country didn't change, their neighborhoods didn't change, that housing the way they knew it, all of these things. It was all these underlying causes. And so the convention was revved up and we were there and uh, we couldn't get press passes because they were not available, we were minority media, but we were in the rafters sitting quietly, uh, trying to make sure nobody found us when a mob did find us. And uh, from that point on, uh, life was held there. And eventually we were driven out of that hall as people threw debris at my news director and I, and he was a proud man who'd been told that he would never uh, be able to be a radio announcer because Negro lips were too thick to pronounce words properly. But he persevered working in black radio, and as I, my lips started to quiver as we were leaving, by now we knew it was dangerous to be there, and I could tell the tears were swelling up inside of me. And he said under his lips softly to me, if you cry, I will break your legs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how he said it. And that's why I like to measure it that way, because it was, a, was humorous enough that it relieved my anxiety, <laughs> true enough that I thought maybe he would. <laughs> So anyway, we exited, but watching the major media work, seeing the hatred from that floor, but seeing their power to tell that story to America, and I thought to myself in the car going home, I want to do something like that. I want to be able to tell people what happens to us. Nobody's truly interested in what happens to us if we don't tell our own story. So anyway, it convinced me 
that I could do this job. Uh, I should try to do this job. That's it. And it started me on a path that turned out to be my life's work. Well, we're all glad you did. We're all <laughs> glad you can get your legs broken in the process. <laughs> Let's fast forward to today. I mean, 1964, there was clearly division in the parties. And how do you think things have evolved or changed? Can you draw some parallels or some differences or some improvements? It's like two different worlds for black Americans today. There's the group we dreamed of that people fought for, marched for, and there are many of you here in this room that represent the end of that dream. And then there's the other world where unemployment is higher than it's ever been, where poverty is just at an unmeasurable amount, um, where walls are so high that some don't see that they can climb over them. Mm -hmm. But the difference is there are people like you who they can see ignored the stereotypical drumming of what it means to be black in America and say you can succeed as well as you can fail. You just have to decide which of those paths you're going to take. And that's the difference. That doesn't mean that we have done as a society what we should have done for them by now hmm. in terms of investing more in education, in terms of offering more opportunities. Um, so as a country, we need to do more. But as a people, uh, there's no denying the world is totally, totally different. I mean, I was, when I was starting in this business, I mean, I was often asked to leave news conferences because no one could imagine that I was a real legitimate reporter. You know, so today, the president of the country is black, so <laughs> at least they can imagine it. <laughs> That's great. I, um, I was thinking about, you know, what other parts of your story I should ask you about. I said, I'll flip the question and say, what other, what were the other defining moments in your life that sort of helped to shape the person that you became? There were a number of touch points. I started out working uh, for all black programmed or black owned media because it was the only place I could work. I worked in black program radio. I was a stringer for Jet Magazine. I, I wrote for anybody who'd take copy from me. And then um, came an opportunity to work in quote unquote major market radio. Got a job in radio. Uh, I was Miss K and E W, and uh, had a disc jockey slot on weekends. Thought I was sailing along. This is it. And one night I got a call from my station manager, and a lot of small talk went on. And finally he got to the bottom line, and he said, "Peril." Uh, summarizing what he said, the bottom line was, "Could you please sound a little more black?" Mm. Nobody will know you're there. Mm. And I, I think, uh, made one of the smartest moves in my career. I simply ignored it, mm. uh, the question. So that was my realization that no matter how good I was, I, I knew, or how good I thought I was, I, I knew why he had hired me. Mm. And then I pursued again uh, a different career because radio was not what I want it to be in anymore. Mm. So I started, uh, after one review of a PSA that I did, or a public service program, got a great review that said there should be a place for me in television. It became my mantra, and I started banging on any door and every door I could, until one day I hit a concrete wall, and that was the day I applied at the ABC station here in town uh, for a job, had an interview, was there, uh, constantly having to refuel the old I can do it. <laughs> and um, at the end of that interview, uh, and there's a long story behind it, you'll have to read the book to get there, but there was something interesting with a famous person <laughs> at that time. But anyway, when we finished our interview, he said to me, um, you know, we're just not hiring negresses right now, but if we ever decide to hire negress, we will certainly call you. And I was I was just so dumbfounded. I, I didn't know how to answer. 
and I was afraid that the old thing, and I didn't have Lewis with me to threaten me about crying. I was afraid <laughs> that was gonna happen, but it didn't. I managed to hold on to that because I realized he didn't know he'd even insulted me. Mm -hmm. And so those were, that was another defining point. But again, I just knew I was gonna find some way somehow to get into this business if for no more reason to let him know that if he wasn't hiring negresses, somebody would. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So those were, those, were, those were big developmental points as I m moved forward and eventually did land a job uh, over at the CBS-owned station. That's great. Yeah. I think the things that you did around pageants <laughs> and beauty pageants was also... Um, an interesting story about how do you get more black women on TV mm -hmm. and while in the background it looked like it sort of happens naturally and there she was, mm -hmm. um, there was definitely people who were pushing for that all along. So your efforts did not go unnoticed. Well, I, I started, <laughs> you know, I was a, a um, single mom with a couple of kids and trying to figure out how I could be relevant at a time when uh, the civil rights movement was just ablaze and on everyone's mind and everyone was doing all they could. And so I, I turned it, even in my conversation with other people, I would say things like, uh, well, I was fighting racism one swimsuit at a time. <laughs> but uh, to justify it. But it, in actuality, the Miss America pageant had a rule uh, in, in its bylaws, its constitution rather, that barred um, the admission for competition of anything other than a white woman. And it was so insulting that the local Chamber of Commerce, Junior Chamber of Commerce, um, fighting against this in liberal San Francisco, aided me in putting together a beauty pageant uh, just for black women. And it was part of a, sh a thing from Los Angeles that had been quite successful. I took on the Northern California part of it, ended up uh, through uh, the process the young women, the big prize was a screen test in Hollywood. And uh, we did well. I mean, one of the winners ended up being nominated for an Academy Award as uh, Margaret Avery in Color Purple. Uh, some of the singers formed a group called The Fifth Dimension and went on to have many hit records. Uh, one of the models became one of the top models. So it wasn't a waste of time. But I think for, for the young women who took part, and I still hear from and friends with many of them now, there was more to it than that. They had to take charm lessons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had to go to, to class to learn, to sit, to stand, you know, even how to get in and out of a car. Uh, and then there was a talent competition. And then we, we had questions that were truly based in modern um, uh, news of the day. So it was a good experience for them. The parents liked it. The girls who came from out of town camped out at our house uh, to stay over so that moms could trust them to come from Fresno and Sacramento to compete. Uh, so it, it, it had its great value. And when the walls began to fall, our women were ready to compete at any level. But I do want to note how I noted the Chamber of Commerce's help. The man who um, was the producer of the Miss Universe pageant also thought the Miss America pageant you know, needed some okay. kind of lesson. And he loaned us the crown for the Miss Universe pageant for our first Miss Bronze. Oh, wow. So we're always proud of that. We have pictures of her with this huge, wonderful, <laughs> multi, whatever, <laughs> crown on her head. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So it was just one of my diversions, uh, a totally volunteer effort. <laughs> but one thing that I know did change lives and it makes me proud. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> so you have a favorite quote about dreams. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna share that with us and then tell us sort of how that came to be your mantra. <laughs> well, the story of how it, I wrote it during those days of looking for a job in television mm -hmm. because it was such a discouraging scene. Now you can imagine I have, there was no woman of color on television. And yet I thought I belonged there. And why did I think I belonged there was another thing, as I said before, not a trained journalist, just thought it was something that was destined for me. So I wrote a little thing that I used to carry around in my, in my date book or in my wallet. I transferred from time to time. And, and it was a simple line that just said, 
Don't be afraid of the space between your dreams and reality. That was the important part. If you dream it, you can make it so. I added that second line as I moved along, but it was to get over my fear of the space that I didn't know about, mm -hmm. that I could find no directional book I could read to tell me how to get over that hesitation of going for what you want. And uh, that was it. Yeah. In fact, that's the one place where Google's in the book. Because <laughs> I, I Googled that one day just so the fun of it, I don't know, some years back, I really should have updated it. But there was at least 60,000 hits on that line. Oh, good. <laughs> You're glad to contribute to right. propagating your views and your mantras. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Think of Google. So we're, we call ourselves Googlers here. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they, they taught you that term in your lunch or in your tour. And, you know, a lot of us work in different functions. Some of us are engineers. Some of us work in sales and finance. Um, but we all are some, we have a lot of passion around technology. Mm -hmm. So we tweet and we use social networks and we access the Internet constantly every day to do everything. And a lot of the news that we read is via this new medium. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you've seen a lot of press around what was reported around Osama bin Laden first was reported mm -hmm. online before it was confirmed in other media. As someone who's kind of transcended media for your career, very, very long and successful career, how do you see kind of technology and internet playing into shaping media to be better, more informative or less informative? Mm -hmm. Tell us what you think. Um, or kind of embellishing or helping things that you do in journalism today? Well, I think they're two different worlds, and I'm glad that one has one name and it's not called journalism okay. on the other one. <laughs> uh, I think it is, um, it's the spreading of the word, and that's traditional going back to the earliest of time when people beat it on a drum. You know, it's the way we communicate one-on-one -on -one with each other. What we journalists have to do is educate people to the fact that uh, if you're reading an article by a person who calls themselves a journalist, you should expect more from that person than just the eyewitness account mm -hmm. that often would end up in our reports. It got wrapped into what we did. It authenticated what we were doing. Um, that you should expect more. You should expect content. You should expect some ex explanation from authority figures as to what happened, even if you know what their words are, you still should be patient enough to find out why they were spoken in the context in which. And that's how I view journalism versus the sharing of an experience or an incident. I think we've always done that. It's just that we do it now by the millions instead, <laughs> <laughs> instead of the few people who are in our neighborhood. And uh, it certainly has been helpful uh, in getting, uh, you know, the word out. But I don't think the tweet in any way um, describes what a good journalist can pull from a person in authority, say, hmm. in terms of questioning them about the action of the moment. And that's where I see the division. I, I hope, indeed, that we will both find a comfortable position uh, that people who, who want to share information instantly uh, certainly should be able to do that. And journalists should be able to learn to use that information in a constructive way. So I'm going to ask you one more question on, on this mm -hmm. very topic, but people start thinking about your own questions and just line up right here at the mic in the center. Um, you said you don't think it defines what a good journalist can do. Mm -hmm. A lot of people here, we're aspiring writers someday. Mm -hmm. We may write a book. Maybe we've written books and we may want to be on TV and mm -hmm. get our 15 minutes or 1,500 hours maybe. <laughs> of um, what advice do you have for those of us who want to be writers or journalists someday? What does make a good journalist or a good content? We call them content creators here because we're so technical mm -hmm. with everything, but mm -hmm. content creators. <laughs> Well, there's something that no technology can replace, and that is the gnawing in the heart, the stomach, to produce information that has value. You've got to have that, plus the mechanics of having it done. 
So therefore, uh, if you want to be a journalist, you've got to really, in today's world, competitive world, you've really got to want to do it. And you, I, li I like to always tell the story that I don't even know when I started to get paid to write. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got my first payment from Jet Magazine, it used to be payments, they were $5 a week. They were supposed to cover my gas <laughs> from San Francisco to <laughs> Oakland to do stories and uh, my postage to mail the things off in my bridge tolls. So that, that they calculated in Chicago that should cost me $5 a week. When I got my job in television, I didn't uh, even ask what the salary was. It, it, so it was a year later almost before I discovered I was being paid half the salary of the men in my unit all because of my union, thank God. <laughs> but uh, that, that's what happened. And of course, I didn't have to take any action because once that fact was uncovered, they just automatically increased me to what they were paying the other guys. So uh, you've got to really want to do this work uh, to, to stay in it. That is, if you want to do, you know, serious. I like, to me, journalism is politics. <laughs> it is an understanding of the environment in which we live. It is adding to that base of knowledge that's shared widely. And the other is some, whatever it is, too. Um, and that means, you know, uh, entertainment news or who's fallen out or broken up a relationship this week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's what headlines the press. But I can only give the advice is to, is to practice to use your skills that you've gotten, to submit material, to have a life's plan. I mean, mine was never to do that for free all of my life, but it was a learning experience. And today's world changes so fast, I can't even tell people which direction to move in order to get to the New York Times, say, today. Uh, you know, one does, you don't even know if there's gonna be a New York Times <laughs> in the future, but you will, if you use your, your art, you, 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 you Use every opportunity you can to learn. Uh, you'll be ready for when your opportunity arrives. Thank you. Question? Hi, I just, when you were um, describing before about two different Americas, um, especially for blacks, <laughs> when it was before and how it is now, and um, granted, blacks have been have had the opportunity to have many more options and just have been granted more opportunities overall now. But it seems as though maybe there's even a bigger gap now between African Americans for those who have and maybe those who are disenfranchised. And it seems that maybe the disenfranchised have somewhat given up. So what do you do and what did you do just through your whole journey just to keep pushing and keep fighting and just never to give up? Mm -hmm. That's my word. Never give up. <laughs> you know, I think the only people, get, the only individual who can defeat you is the internal one who tells you you can't do. Um, and the reason I use the dream analogy, because going back to slavery times even, the dream was the one thing that you own that no one could take from you. So if you can dream it for yourself, you can envision yourself, you can see yourself doing that, you want to do it that bad, you usually, unless, you know, there's some flaw, and there are plenty of flaws, uh, you'll get there or close to it. But I don't think that anyone can give you um, a roadmap today to how to get, you know, if your goal is to be a columnist for the New York Times or even a reporter for the Times or the Wall Street Journal, it can give you a roadmap because uh, we don't quite know what it is that'll get you there. Uh, probably many of you with your, um, you know, with your knowledge of technology today are far more uh, desirable for a company to hire than someone who writes about politics because everyone's written a book somewhere along the line, something about politics. But, uh, but you're still in a mystery world for many people. And so it's, it's, it's using what you learn from wherever you are to apply it to where you want to go. And that's sort of the way I made it, by writing a little bit, talking a little bit, putting them together, convincing somebody that it would work if, uh, you know, if we did it. I love working with our interns. And at, at, at 
KQED because I, you know, I go through an airport and somebody will stop me and say, do you remember in 1987 I was the intern and, <laughs> and blankety blank, and you know, and, and oh, I'm working in London now for blankety blank, <laughs> and, and it gives me joy. So I think it, that, uh, that, that relying on yourself, uh, preparing yourself, and knowing where you want to go is about the only thing I can say. Hi, Ms. Davis. Uh, my name is Justin Hauser, and I just started here at Google in September. I'm a recent graduate of Morehouse College. Um, I work in people operations, our HR department. And the question I have for you is, um, you talked about some of your notable uh, interviews, so with Muhammad Ali, Frank Sinatra. Did you have a favorite moment or a, a favorite interview uh, that you, know, you just can't forget that you wanted to share? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I have many favorable <laughs> interviews I can't forget, and people that I met. You know, it's, uh, I, I like to remind myself of this because I have this list of people, uh, somebody in introducing me one day, read off a list of the people that I had interviewed, and people who, with some name and note. You know, I realized I'd left Bob Hope's name off. Now, how could you leave off Bob Hope's name? I don't know, but I managed to do that uh, because there were so many the people accessible before the media sort of got mad the way it is today, I call it that, because there, you know, this gaggle of, of folks pulling at you, that it was, it, it was possible to do that. Um, I think I'm fortunate to have had the access to presidents and um, other high-ranking political figures from other countries to talk with. Um, I can't argue against the fact that uh, that I was fascinated by Fidel Castro. I had a chance to meet him over a couple of times. Um, I've always thought that, um, and said it to him to his face, but I doubt if he would have, been as, would have been able to do the things that he's done, that Jimmy Carter was one of the most um, thoughtful presidents in terms of the have-nots that I've ever met. I admired greatly Robert Kennedy because of the change he made in his life and had a chance to talk with him about it, which was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I met with and talked with, in awe every moment, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, and he was a great man. He took the time to try to assuade me of my feelings of guilt by not doing more during the civil rights era. Um, even meeting Lin Lena Horne, who said to a group of us who were visiting her one afternoon, mm. no matter what happens, take your naps at this age. <laughs> 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 and she was right. She was entertaining at the Fairmont Hotel. And every afternoon at 2 o'clock, she took a nap because she knew she needed to be her best. I, I, you know, things, strange little things that people say to you. Yeah. Um, I would not have made the the greatest decision, the luckiest one of my life, were it not for Nancy Wilson, who convinced me to marry my husband. We've only been together for 47 years, so she sure didn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> uh, there, there are many people that I can talk of as individuals. The story that lives with me today, and I still am trying to beat the drum about it, is um, I went on a trip to Kenya and to Tanzania after the bombing of the American embassies there. 5,000 people injured, 240 dead, uh, all but 11 of them uh, Africans. 150 people blind today because of that. So far as I know, still with my last communication with the woman who introduced me to that story, many of them were still waiting to be compensated for those burns and injuries. Mm. It was, as you know, the act of Al-Qaeda. And uh, our government at that time, I guess, was mystified as to how they were going to fight the war on terror. So they were not helpful at, in those beginning months to the Africans. And I went with a woman to take medical supplies to the injured. Glad I could go, but felt bad as an American that we as volunteers 
had to come and bring bandages and prostheses and other things to aid these people. So for a number of years, I've always beat the drum whenever I could for the people particularly of Nairobi because that's where the major injuries were. Businesses lost, families, uh, you know, totally destroyed. And I, I still feel the pride of the African psychiatrists and psychologists who went on the radio to tell the people they shouldn't blame anyone in, at that time. What they needed to do more was to talk about helping each other, which they did. So that's my soapbox that I, I've stood on for a very long time because it touched me so deeply uh, to, to have had the chance to be there and, and to do something. I better stop. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, thanks so much for coming and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, I just wonder, what was your earliest recollection of someone or something that gave you the idea of never giving up? Well, I, that's a truly long story, and I talk about my childhood. I, you know, uh, born to a teen mom, given, given away as a baby to a relative who died soon after. Uh, by the time I was three to four years old, she, she had died of tuberculosis. Uh, being transferred around a lot between relatives always, but living by the time I was 12, I had lived in seven different households. I, I'm talking about this so you could see that life was not a bed of roses. Um, finally, realizing at some point, by the time I was, by the time my mother left home, that I had to be responsible for me. And I would only be giving up on myself if I gave up. So before it was don't be afraid, it was never give up, never give up. And my dream at that time was to make someone care about me. So to do that, I had all kinds of ways of doing it, from getting baptized in the Ashita River, which I hope will not flood the town of Monroe again. I was born during what was called the flood of the century back then when Louisiana was being inundated with water. Um, so it, it was a tough life, but it, it wasn't so tough that it defeated me. And it was because I was using whatever tools I had to survive and to um, be useful. And I think when I started hitting these other bumps, they seem minor compared to you know, what I had been living through. I love it. In, in the book, there's, um, there's, there are a number of pictures in the center. And there's one that looks sort of middle class till you look at it really closely. It's me standing around a table with a group of people in formal attire. And I always like to tell the understory that dining room table we were standing around is the table which I slept under for three years on the floor there <laughs> in my aunt's dining room as I finished high school. So I think there are ways that you just take life and turn it around. So would you say you're a natural optimist then? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, of course <laughs> I mean, I'm an optimist. <laughs> it could just as easily. No, but I know I could have like, become a pessimist. You know, no, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm always expecting the best from circumstances and people and always saying to my husband, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. <laughs> I know it is. I'm usually the one fretting the most about it, but I'm also the one that feels it's going to work out. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Ms. Davis. It's an honor to have you here. This is a little high. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the late 60s and early 70s here, in particular, another Davis, Professor Angela Davis, sort of that experience and sort of how you were involved with that, her mm -hmm. trial, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, other than being given the Berkeley beat, which I was given as my first major assignment, and of course, you know what went on in Berkeley during the late 60s, uh, that meant that, uh, that I got used to being regularly tear gassed. That was it. Uh, but I did have my own gas mask, so I was better off than the students. <laughs> but uh, that I covered lots of those kinds of situations. And then there was the Patty Hearst kidnapping, which I also reported on, reported on which 
led to uh, an incident in our lives that were um, as close to making me think hard about whether I belonged in the business or not. Angela Davis was uh, suspected of aiding um, an attempted breakout at San Quentin. And she was pursued across the country and finally arrested. And every day on the noon news at KPIX, we did some story relating to that incident. And um, then one day, we lived in El Cerrito, an El Cerrito police officer came to our door and uh, I thought it was for a news tip. <laughs> Why else would the police officer come? So he told us that he had heard, or they had heard, that there was a plot to kidnap our daughter in reprisal mm -hmm. for the Patty Hearst kidnapping. Mm -hmm. And they thought uh, these Hells Angels, not non-thinkers, thought that I was Angela Davis's sister. So therefore, if you know, my people, as I said, could, which really were not my people, <laughs> uh, who really did all of the work around uh, that whole thing, the SLA, uh, but that they were going to kidnap my daughter. And um, so we, we decided to, to, to move. We couldn't convince them. How could I? Couldn't go on the air and say, that you, you know, you're making a mistake. So the police encouraged us to move, which we did. We moved two blocks from where we worked where I worked, uh, where I'd had access to my daughter. We never proved whether it was going to happen. My daughter was given police protection. She never knew it. And we didn't tell her about it for a very long time. But at that point, I, wor I wondered, um, mm. indeed, if this was a business that we should be in. And my son didn't escape his turn. <laughs> I did another series of stories, not to do with Angela Davis, but about racial profiling that it, I ended up on the list of the um, not very welcome list at the Oakland Police Department. And uh, it, was a, it was a good series of stories. Um, they never proved that I said anything that was inaccurate, but that was not the point. But what did happen is that my son was arrested um, for making an illegal right-hand turn. And Kel for hours, never charged, basically. But I got the message, and that was the other time that both my husband and I had to serious talk as to you know, how far do we go. Our decision was not to leave the business, but it was, for me anyway, to stop being the face of that story, because now it wasn't me, it was my kid. So uh, Angela Davis, incidentally, and I have remained in touch with one another over the years. She's a, a lovely, intelligent woman and um, has continued her work with uh, prison reform all of these years and stayed true to that. So I had to say that. <laughs> still have a few more minutes, so if there's other questions. I, I still have a list here too, but I don't want to <laughs> hog all the time. Please, go ahead. <laughs> I've got two people standing up, so go for it. <laughs> Hi, Ms. Davis, thanks mm -hmm. for coming. Um, as a woman and an African-American woman, did you find when you started out reporting uh, that they gave you different sorts of stories to report on? And what were those stories like? And um, another question, are there any unsolved cases that you covered that you still wonder about? Mm. Well, my daughter's kidnapping is one that was different. <laughs> <laughs> and so we never, we never got the real story on that one. Well, you know, with me, it was that they would, the whole thing was to see how long I could last. And I love telling the story in the book about a cameraman in particular whose job it was to make sure that I would get out of the business as quickly as possible. In fact, he didn't think I'd last two weeks even. And that was the, the famous uh, robber chase story that I tell about a couple of weeks in. I don't even think I'd even been on the air by then. But anyway, there was a live shootout a got robbers in a car shooting a cop car following it i was assigned to go out with him we get in his car it's an old peugeot hardly runs but he is really a darling of the police department so in this chase he 
moves in front of the police car, which they didn't like at all. The cop, the robbers are shooting in our direction. He decides to pick up his Bell and Howe sil silent camera because he wants to get the action and the car is speeding and he tells me to hold on to the steering wheel. <laughs> so uh, eventually he was convinced by whatever means, the radio was squeaking like crazy uh, for us to get, you know, to, sens to get some sensibility about this. And so we got out of that. And then after that, there were other tests like that. Uh, so I can't complain that I got all the soft stories although some did come my way. I did ask for tough assignments because I wanted to play the game and to see, you know, and to see, to show them that I, I could do it, <laughs> whatever that was. And by the time the next woman got hired was a woman named Christine Ludd, was hired, it's Channel 7, to show you how, what high esteem all my good work had done. The news director there said, if they told me to hire a puppy dog to keep my broadcast license, I would, when asked why he hired her. <laughs> so it made neither of us felt very proud of that moment. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mrs. Davis. My name is Charlotte. I'm in the marketing department here at Google. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had the opportunity to uh, watch a screening of a documentary called Misrepresentation that talked about uh, how women are portrayed and perceived in the media. And one of the things that stood out is that um, a lot of w female reporters and anchor women today um, are made out to be very like kind of uh, sexified and objectified with like low cut tops, a lot of makeup, um, hair, and there aren't very many women anchors who are considered to be serious reporters. So I was wondering um, in your heyday, were you ever pressured to kind of play up your feminine traits and be more about the physical or the pretty uh, over uh, uh, over emphasizing rather than the work you were doing. So was that ever a factor that came into play? I've led a lucky life. I came along when feminism was really just getting on the ground. We were trying to get women to wear less makeup, to do less in terms of grammar, glamour. I have to tell you now, one trip to Los Angeles and to see the anchor teams and you worry as about what has happened. But on the other hand, if you listen to the reports coming out of Egypt, Libya, wherever there are the worst conditions ever, almost always now, it's a woman who's there. Now, this is not true with every woman who's there, but some of it is because women who want to do this work, as I told you, have put themselves in places in countries where there's news to report. And they call, call so I'm told, they call the news operations and say, I'm in blankety blank blank. Would you like a report from here? And it's launched a number of careers. Uh, and again, you know, it's following my own philosophy. I have to say that's a good thing. But on the other hand, the networks have closed their bureaus and they, they, when they had them, you know, they were guys. Uh, now the women are proving that they can handle the toughest assignments. So we have that group of women who are, some of, who are suffering greatly in some of these countries because they aren't protected enough. Uh, and the other women who really want to be in show business. And that's why they're sitting at those anchor desks. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. I'm happy to ask the last question, but if there's someone in the audience who wants to ask the last question, you can. Okay. All right, I'll do it. Okay. Um, so after listening and talking with you and just sharing with you over the last couple of hours, last 45 minutes in this, in this part of the session, it's no secret, everyone can all agree that you've had a tremendous career and you've taken the role less traveled on behalf of all of us in this room. But what are appetites? What should we watch for next? What topics are you passionate about? Who would you like to sit across from and, and interview? So when we're following you for the next many, many years in your, in your career, what can we be looking for? 
Well, there, there's one serious answer and one answer uh, because I dream it and, and therefore it's going to happen. Okay. Uh, one is that my interest right now lies with the three strikes law. I, I feel there's a lot of uh, unfairness uh, and it's the way it's written, and the way it's been applied, and it's been applied mostly to, that it falls on uh, black males uh, mm -hmm. who carry that burden. Uh, there is a project uh, here at Stanford where they're doing all the research to, to, to prove what I'm thinking, and I'm following that and reporting on it. I've had the privilege of going into Soledad prison and s sitting for an afternoon in the prison yard with as many three strikers as would come forward and listen to their stories and their interesting stories. Uh, we know the hysteria around why it happened, but I understand now that there, there at least are conferences being held to, to, uh, to talk about this. And the other, of course, has to do with our charming president. <laughs> Uh, my dream is, and it's, I said it's going to happen, I have not had an opportunity to speak with Barack Obama. And I hope I do before I hang up my spurs, as <laughs> the old Westerners used to say. Uh, it would be a shame to have been around through all of these presidents and talked to so many of them, and then the hero of the moment, our century, uh, escape but I'll keep saying this in public long enough till somebody one of these days <laughs> will say, hey, Barack, remember that old lady out? No. <laughs> and it will come true because yeah. one of the reasons that way you get what you want is you got to ask for it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And this will be on YouTube. Oh, boy. So then if you yeah. watches it, All right, you hear you'll me. be able to see this exact quote. Right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. For those who are interested, you can stay after. You're gonna, she's going to do a book signing, and we just are honored to have you in our presence and for sharing your story. Thank you for coming. Your hospitality couldn't have been greater. Thank you so much. <laughs>